The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Ohio Department of Education. This is WVIZ TV 25 Cleveland. Um, um, apple pie and mama's cooking them truly American. Bum, bum, bum. Rich, poor, black, white, how you look. You can make it if American. Just do it your stuff and do it well. Lots of boys did it and we think they're swell. It's the spirit of America, the people. That's really American. That's really American. Hi. How do you feel today? Well, I feel pretty good. You know, our health has a lot to do with the man we're going to talk about today, Dr. Jonas E. Salk. Dr. Salk is the American physician and research scientist who was the guiding force behind the discovery of the Salk polio vaccine. Now, let's go back to the year 1916, when the United States was plagued by a polio epidemic. Right now. An estimated 27,000 cases of polio are anticipated before the end of the summer. Conservative estimates are that 7,000 of these cases will be fatal. New York City residents are fleeing the city in panic. Sources there report 4,500 cases of polio in that city, and the summer is not yet ended. The president today released... That's enough of that. I wonder where they're putting all those sick people. Well, I read that all the hospitals are overcrowded. And frankly, I don't think they know what to do with those polio patients. I hope none of us gets polio. Why doesn't somebody do something about it? Why doesn't somebody do something about it? That question was asked thousands of times all over the world. Polio. The scientific name for it is poliomyelitis. It's also called infantile paralysis. It's an infectious disease of the central nervous system that causes temporary paralysis in some and permanent paralysis or even death to others. Let's look at this culprit. Here's isolated poliomyelitis virus magnified 180,000 times. Doesn't look too dangerous, does it? Oh, but it sure is. This disease is usually contracted by children, especially between the ages of 5 and 10. Sometimes adults are stricken. Now, that 1916 epidemic produced thousands of permanently paralyzed polio victims destined to spend the rest of their lives in wheelchairs. Others more fortunate were able to walk again only with the aid of braces or crutches. Still others were left unable to breathe on their own and were required to have special machines help them breathe. They spent their lives locked inside the iron lung. Well, obviously, somebody did do something about it. Because today, polio is practically non-existent. And here's one of the men who started the fight to conquer polio. You recognize him? He became the 32nd president of the United States. The picture you see was taken in 1920. Here's another photo of him. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, that is President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who himself was stricken by polio in 1921. And it left him permanently paralyzed. Now, President Roosevelt and a lawyer friend, Basil O'Connor, realized that to conquer polio, a lot of money would have to be raised in order to carry on research as well as to properly care for polio victims. Their first projects were dances. 6,000 balls held all over the nation on the president's birthday. Their motto was, dance so that others may walk. And they were able to raise over one million dollars. In 1938, they established the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. And they went on radio and in newspapers spreading the news about the March of Dimes. 
And so moms, dads, oh, grandmothers, grandfathers, boys and girls from all over the country joined the fight against polio, sending in their dimes to the White House. These dimes added up to another one million dollars. As Basil O'Connor, then president of the National Foundation, said, Until we came along, most hospitals wouldn't accept polio patients and hardly anyone knew how to care for them. There was a terrible shortage of trained minds and trained hands. Each year, the March of Dimes asked the American public for more money. And each year, polio continued to add more, more and more victims to its dreaded list. Severe epidemics had occurred in the mid-30s and again in 1944. Mr. O'Connor realized that many distinguished scientists were working on a cure for polio. But he was more interested in preventing polio, stopping it before it could happen. Other diseases were prevented by vaccines. Why not polio, he thought. Of course, it would be a long, hard process, and he knew the reasons. First of all, there was the previous polio vaccine test, which had paralyzed 17 people. And finding a polio vaccine would be tougher because unlike other diseases which were caused by bacteria, polio was caused by viruses. Now, bacteria can be grown in laboratory cultures for study, but polio viruses could grow only in monkeys and humans. And to complicate matters, polio was caused not by one, but by several types of viruses. And finally, the medical profession was convinced that all injected vaccines would contain living polio viruses with the possibility of infecting while vaccinating. And here is where Jonas Salk would be distinguished from all the others. For Dr. Salk believed that an effective vaccine could be made from killed viruses, which would not infect, but instead would cause the blood to produce antibodies to fight off polioviruses. Now that principle became evident to Dr. Salk while researching influenza at the University of Michigan. And then, with the United States involved in World War II, influenza research became even more important. Salk became a member of the Influenza Commission and was sent to Europe to organize diagnostic laboratories in anticipation of any flu epidemic. Salk felt satisfaction in this work, and the flu vaccine was finally developed. But you know, he wanted to be independent, to be free to work as he desired. In short, he wanted to do it his way. The opportunity to establish his own research center was then presented to him in 1947 by the University of Pittsburgh. Happily, he accepted a grant from Harry Weaver, director of research of the March of Dimes Foundation. Dr. Weaver was anxious to get Salk working, so he began talking to the foundation committeemen immediately. Yes, Dr. Salk is young, but I happen to think that's important. He's too young to have been frightened by the early vaccine disaster. Oh, I respect the right of you distinguished gentlemen to guard your reputations. But in order to win, we have to be willing to lose. Well, now, I'm dispensing March of Dimes funds that come from the people. And the people are paying for results, not reputations. Well, you distinguished committee men, are eager to work on a cure, but you're reluctant to talk about prevention. Salk will talk prevention. You talk 10 years for the ideal vaccine. Salk talks two years for a vaccine which is admittedly less than ideal, but you say the difference is eight years. I say the difference is 320,000 kids. Polio research was slow because of the same old problem the inability to grow polio virus. But the year 1949 brought the discovery that would change the direction of all polio research. The American biologist, Dr. John Enders, and his co-workers found a method of growing the polio virus in cultures of non-nervous tissue. This is tissue that's not in the body. Now, from there on, the light was green. Salk studied Enders' work and mastered the technique in his own laboratory. Then other distinguished scientists discovered that there were several strains of the polio virus, which meant that the ideal vaccine would have to contain all the strains in order to be effective. Dr. Salk decided after many months of testing to include three major strains in his vaccine. Next was the problem of amounts. 
how much of each killed virus in the vaccine would be necessary to produce enough antibodies to work against the polio viruses. Well, Dr. Salk found himself working longer and longer hours, sometimes 14 hours a day, and often, often seven days a week. Besides his own work, he supervised work of other scientists in the laboratory and attended conferences to keep up to date on the latest polio research. He often met with Basil O'Connor and Harry Weaver to keep them posted on his progress. Well, the day finally came when Salk had an actual vaccine in his hand. But he realized that it was just the beginning, for the vaccine would have to be tested and retested, changed, tested and retested again, discussed back.